more. Wide Sight TV. So Alice, obviously we're going through a period of vast transformation in the energy sector and offshore wind will be a huge part of that. So how does the transmission system need to evolve to support that? Thanks Nova. So there's, there's a couple of aspects to that. So the first is that we need to make sure there's enough um, transmission network there to get the, um, the power that the wind produces to where it's needed, where it's to be used. Um, and then the other aspect is to make sure that as electricity system operator we can, we can still operate that system and keep it um, safe and secure. Um, so if I look first at sort of making sure we've got enough network in place, so we've got 10 gigawatts of um, offshore wind now, there's a government target for that to be 40 gigawatts by 2030, um, and then if you look at our future energy scenarios that we develop to help us look ahead and plan, plan the network, um, two of those scenarios suggest that by 2040 um, there'll be over 80 gigawatts of offshore wind, so doubling in 10 years, and then by 2050 to meet net zero, that's um, that's getting up to sort of 100 plus gigawatts. So, you know, we've got massive increases very quickly. Um, so we need to make sure that the network is, is in place to do that. And actually that, you know, that we're, we're, we're most effectively using the space that we've got to do that. Um, so at the moment, um, offshore wind is primarily connected to sort of each individual wind farm has its own connection. Um, you know, I think it's, it's probably you know, and that's worked really well but you know looking forward we don't think that's going to continue to work well either for consumers in terms of costs the environment or um, and people who live in the communities that infrastructure goes through so um, what we're doing at the moment is working under the um, the offshore transmission network review that um, the department for business energy and industrial strategy is leading um, to look at how a, a more coordinated approach can be taken to connect to all of that offshore wind both sort of looking at what can be done fairly in the fairly short term with projects that are fairly well advanced and you know we don't want to obviously disrupt those um, through to those that are aiming towards that 40 gigawatts by 2030 and looking at um, how we can take a much more centralised and coordinated plan-led approach to, to designing the network and, and connecting them and then sort of looking at, you know, after 2030 onwards actually what's the, the best enduring regime, you know, what's the best way to connect these going forward. So so that's that's sort of the, the network aspect and, and then you know, I, I was sort of talking offshore wind, you know, it, it, we, we can't sort of separate the onshore and the offshore network. We need to make sure, you know, if that wind comes in in Scotland, it can get down to England or, you know, where, where there are large towns or cities or, or industry that's going to use it. Um, so making sure that those those two aspects are really coordinated and we're, we're thinking about the best way to transport that around. Um, and then there's also making sure that we can operate that system um, safely and securely and have the tools um, to allow us to do that. What is the biggest challenge that you're working through right at the moment? I mean, what you know, if I said to you in a year's time you would like something to be different, what would that thing be and what would it look like? So I think that the biggest challenge for us at the moment is is getting sort of changing from the approach that we have at the moment um, to the particularly for the, the sort of the central plan-led approach um, that we need to connect the 40 gigawatts by 2030. So, you know, we're developing a new process. We've got a slightly different role as the electricity system operator. So it's really sort of developing and, and, and embedding in all of those aspects to make sure that we can deliver that, what we're calling the holistic network design to so a coordinated design across the onshore and offshore networks um, in the very tight timescales that we need to do that. And, and those tight timescales are, are necessary because, you know, you might think 2030 is what, eight and a half years away, eight and a half years away. Um, but there is a very long lead time on developing both the onshore transmission network and the offshore and the, and the wind farm. So it, you know, it's actually not a lot of time to get that all done. And, and do you think that ultimately, can we actually operate the transmission system carbon free? Yes, yeah, ultimately we can. So our, our, um, our ambition as the electricity system operator is that by 2025, uh, we want to be able to operate the operate a carbon free um, system. So at the moment, we don't have the tools to be able to do that. And if we, if and when we get days that um, deliver a, a completely carbon free system, we actually have to ask some of those um, low carbon generators to switch off and um, ask some of the fossil fuel power plants to switch on. So we need, we, you know, we need to move away from that and get to the position where we've got the tools, the services, the markets that allow us to, to, to be able to operate that system you know, when the market delivers us a, a, a carbon free 
uh, you know, fully carbon free system. So that might just be you know, for one hour to start with, going up to one day, you know, going up to a week, a month, a bit like we've seen with the coal free days where you know, it used to be a big thing. Now it, you know, it, it's just the norm. So we're doing a number of things. We're, we're developing, as I say, the tools in the markets. Um, for example, we are we're running a number of what we call Pathfinder projects, sort of learning by doing um, to give us uh, what are called stability services. So you know, at a high level, just so that it helps us keep the electricity system stable. And, and you know, it, it's the sorts of things that fossil fuel plants would provide just by the nature of how they operate, but we now need to find in, in other ways. Um, so we're doing that around voltage. And then also, you know, it's, it's not something we generally like to think about, but you know, at the moment, there are plans in place if the, the network, we have a blackout and, and how we restart it. And generally, again, that's large um, large power plants. We, we're developing ways that we can you know, restart it you know, in those, hopefully, you know, hopefully never be necessary. But, you know, so we've got the, the, the tools to be able to restart the network without those large power plants. I'm going to come to you now, Jenny. Now, you're coming up to your second anniversary at um, National Grid East, though. Um, tell me... How Tell me about your pathway into the sector. How do you find yourself here right now? Um, so I studied maths at uni and I really wanted a career that was rewarding uh, while allowing me to apply the skills I'd learned on my degree. Um, and I didn't know much about the energy industry when I applied for the National Grid, Grid Scheme, but I applied for it um, and I, I got in. And uh, there was three six-month placements uh, in the Grad Scheme. Uh, so two, I did two inside uh, the electricity system operator and one outside the electricity system operator. Um, and so that really allowed me to get an exper experience all different areas of the business and kind of understand um, the energy industry. Um, and I really think oh, I also did my final placement um, in uh, offshore coordination, which is the team I'm in now for my first non-graduate role. So I, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, and I'd really recommend uh, the graduate scheme to all recent graduates um, as it's a really um, it's a really supportive place to start your career and kind of shape your career. I and mean, it's really great to work for a company that plays such a crucial role um, in the road to net zero by 2050. And um, our new talent applications are now open. Excellent plug, Jenny, I like it. Um, but, so tell me, what, what are you working on now? Uh, so I'm in uh, the ESO's Offshore Coordination Early Opportunities Team. Um, so we're looking at uh, facilitating the transition uh, from the status quo, so the current regime for connecting offshore wind uh, to the enduring integrated regime. Um, so we're working with developers of offshore wind farms and interconnectors that have projects that are at a relatively um, advanced stage of development. And we're kind of looking at um, the barriers to coordinating those, um, as there's a lot of industry change that needs to happen um, in order to uh, co coordinate those those wind farms, um, so we're kind of progressing those changes um, while maintaining the pace of delivery to meet uh, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. That sounds like a fantastic thing to be involved in. What's your actual role in that? What are you actually doing as part of that team? We have a lot of stakeholders that are involved in, so uh, we meet regularly with uh, stakeholders such as uh, Defra, um, the developers. Um, off German Bay, so um, there's, a lot, there's a lot of stakeholder engagement that's happening. Um, I'm particularly looking into contracts for difference, um, so the subsidy for offshore wind farms and the barriers um, that coordinating wind farms to, to, to ensure that uh, the wind farms that are coordinating will still be um, able to apply for a contract for difference. I'm also working with a lot of teams internally, um, so uh, our connections processes may need to change um, and also we need to do a lot of uh, industry codes change so it's so a lot of engagement and we're getting a lot of things progressing. What's your uh, career goal, your next career goal? <laughs> you sprung that on me. Um, I'm sure for now I'd, um, uh, I'd still like to continue working in the team and see through a lot of the changes that were progressing and make sure there's a, an action plan. I obviously like to see 40 gigawatts of offshore wind happen in 2030, but that's quite a long time away. Um, but I see myself uh, staying at National Grid ESO and can continue to progress and hopefully I'll continue learning at the pace that I'm learning at, at right now. Energy. Energy. Marine. Energy. 
power. Wide Sight TV.